You know, I've been told that halfway up Mount Everest, there is a lodge where people can stop and relax, where climbers can just take in the beautiful scenery, enjoy a cup of coffee. Most people don't ever go past the halfway point because the view is so nice and everything is so pleasant at that halfway point. And I don't blame them. More than 200 people have died trying to reach the top of Mount Everest. I don't know why you'd even try in the first place. But there are a lot of people who don't go to the top, but rather settle for halfway. Now that may be okay when climbing Everest. It's not okay in our Christian life, in our daily walk with God. Halfway is never good enough. Unfortunately, we as Christians can find ourselves relaxing, becoming complacent in our daily walk with God, thinking that we have achieved the ultimate when in fact there's still a lot that we have left to do. You know, it's going to take vision if we're going to continue to climb. Life can either be a random journey full of twists and turns that eventually lead to a dead end, or life can be an intentional journey, a purposeful journey, climbing the upward way, never stopping to relax, never stopping to enjoy the scenery, but continually growing and climbing each and every day. Vision is the act or power of sensing with the eyes, but more than that, it's a vivid and distinctive conception of something in the future. It's about looking past the here and now and toward the possibilities of the future. It's about looking past the way things are right now and seeing the beautiful way that they could be. Vision is about focusing on a better tomorrow and not being satisfied with today. Proverbs 29 and 18 reads, where there is no vision, the people will perish. And let me tell you, if we don't have a vision here for the Lord's people at Oldham Lane, we will eventually perish. We may not close the doors of the church building, but we will be a, a dying church, dying where we sit individually and collectively. You know, all of us here at Oldham Lane need to be visionary. The alternative is to be stationary. And we don't want that. There's a passage of Scripture that I've used many times in talking about passion and fervor. And so, humor me a little bit as I point to it again. It's one that we should know well by now. And it's found in Revelation chapter 3, starting in verse 14. There, it writes, To the angel of the church in Laodicea, write the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God says this, I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot, so because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. And I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love I reprove and discipline. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and will dine with him and he with me on my throne. As I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches." You may or may not know that Laodicea was one of the richest commercial cities in the world at this time. They were known for many things. They were known for a great medical center, which many people took advantage of. They were known as a, as a health resort or a health spa. There were many hot springs there that people would come and uh, believe that they had restorative power. They were also known for this Phrygian eye salve that many people sought out to help them with their eye problems. This was a booming city. The people there probably were very fat and sassy. They felt like they had made it, perhaps were complacent and resting on their laurels because of all the things they had, there was one thing that they lacked, and it was an important thing. It was passion. It was zeal. It was fervor. They had lost that in the process. They had become self-sufficient and proud, and all of these things had created a gulf between them 
and God. Jesus states, I know your deeds and that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. We've talked about this before. The word for spit here in the Greek is ameo. It's where we get our English word emetic. And if you know what an emetic is, it is something that is used to induce vomiting. Many times, at least years ago, Lukewarm water was used as an emetic. If somebody swallowed something that was harmful, they would give them lukewarm water so that they would throw it up and get rid of the poison. In essence, Jesus is saying here, you make me want to throw up. You make me sick. You are neither hot nor cold, and because of that, I want to vomit. I have no desire to make our Lord sick. Do you? I have no desire to cause our Lord to have an upset stomach. Do you? You see, Jesus makes very clear his distaste for indifference. Again, he states, so because you are lukewarm, because you are neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. I wish you were hot or cold, he says. I wish you were at least one or the other. And I don't know about you, but that stops me in my tracks, and it makes me think, well, now wait a minute. You'd rather me be cold than not be anything? Wouldn't it be better to be at least somewhat half-hearted or indifferent than to be cold? But you think about it further, and you think, you know, if you were in a transitional state, if you were a babe in Christ, then perhaps somebody can have some patience with you. Perhaps, you know, it's, it's easier to be long-suffering when you're trying to grow someone from a babe in Christ, from milk to meat. But to choose, to willfully choose to be half-hearted is not good enough. We have to be committed. We have to be all in. We rejoice when a new Christian begins their life and becomes more involved, and we're patient with them as we allow them to to grow into their new role, at least for a while. But the tale is different when it is a Christian who willfully chooses to be less than what they should be. May we never settle for less. I've told you before, as a minister, I get asked the question a lot, what is your biggest frustration? My biggest frustration as a minister is to see Christians settling for less in their daily lives, choosing willfully to be less than what they should be. It's not a shame to aim high and miss the target. You know what is a shame? To aim too low. And yet so many Christians are aiming too low. Complacency means that I have quit trying. At least I've quit trying to give my all. I have stopped putting forth the effort to grow and mature into the Christian that I should be. In 2 Peter 3 and 18, it reads, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In this passage, the word grow in the Greek is in the present indicative form, which may not mean much to you, but in essence, all that means is Peter is saying, keep on growing, keep on maturing. You never stop. As long as there is breath in your lungs, you continue to grow and mature because when we stop growing in our relationship with God, we die. Having a successful relationship with God is like any other successful relationship. It's going to take work on our part. We're going to have to do something. We're going to have to put it as a top priority in our lives. James said in James 4 and 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. The more fervent we are in drawing near to God, the closer we are to God, the further we are from Satan. And so emphasis needs to be put every day on growing closer and closer to God. In order to remain steadfast and to avoid complacency, we must seek closeness with God through spiritual growth. Complacency is a disease, and we have to inoculate ourselves against it. And we do so by continually moving, by continually growing and maturing. It's when we allow ourselves to become complacent that rigor mortis sets in. I don't want to be responsible for our Lord wanting to vomit. So let's be a people who are united in growth. Let's let Oldham Lane be a church that is always climbing and never satisfied with halfway. It's easy to do, isn't it? It's easy to kind of sit back and look at things and say, wow, look at what we've accomplished. We started with 70-plus people back in the mid-90s, and look at where we're at now, over 550 members. Isn't that a great thing? Sure it is. Can we appreciate that? Absolutely. And we should. But is this where we stop? No, never. 
And I'm not just talking about growing numerically. That's what we tend to focus on when we talk about growing. Set that aside for a moment. That's fine and good. I'm talking about growing individually. In order to be a church on fire, each and every one of us as Christians must be growing and maturing individually. So what are you doing to be on the move? What are you doing to enhance growth, to be fervent, to be passionate in your service? We have to understand the importance of wearing the name Christian. I realize that is a title or a name that everyone and anyone, it seems, wears nowadays. A Christian, it seems, is defined now as anyone who just remotely even believes in Christ. You realize that that's not what the name means. You realize that the biblical definition of Christian is much more narrow or narrower than what our culture tends to use to define that name. A Christian is a Christ follower, plain and simple. If you're not following Christ according to his will, it doesn't matter how much you believe in him, you're not a Christ follower. Just to have some mental assent or an agreement that Christ exists is not being a Christ follower. To be a Christ follower is to diligently pursue him in each and everything that you do in your life. To want to walk closely beside him. To be like him. To take on his characteristics. We proudly wear the name Christian when we are seeking to do his will in everything. And passionately pursuing a relationship with him. And with that we need to understand that there is a difference between being involved and being committed. Now, I don't want to put a negative spin on being involved, and I don't want to play word games here. Certainly, being involved is important. But I think sometimes we sell Christians on the fact that, that all you have to do is be involved when involvement is not the goal. In fact, I want to make a petition that we change Jake's title from involvement minister to commitment minister because that's really what we're talking about is commitment. Yes, it's great to be involved, but involvement denotes association, really, doesn't it? You can be involved on your own terms. You can choose whatever you want to get involved with, but what we're talking about when it comes to a relationship with God is commitment. We can be involved in various things in the church and various programs and ministries, and that's great. I don't want to belittle that. But when we're talking about a relationship with God, we're talking about commitment. We're not talking about a mere association. One of my favorite coaches, Howard Schnellenberger, used to say it like this. He, so, he said, when you have ham and eggs for breakfast, the chicken that laid the egg was involved, but the pig that provided the ham was totally committed. And that's exactly right. There's a difference between being associated and being totally full-on committed. And obviously, what we're pursuing, or at least what we should be seeking, is commitment. Being a follower of Christ requires more than just mere association. It means more than involvement. It demands commitment. Listen to Jesus' words in Luke chapter 14, starting in verse 25. Now, large crowds were going along with him, and he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has, when he has set out and laid the foundation, he is not able to finish. All who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So then, none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. A Christian isn't somebody who just believes in Christ. A Christian is someone who follows, who's calculated the cost and is all in. He's willing to take up a cross. He's willing to deny himself, die to himself. That's what a Christian is. No one can claim that title unless they're willing to do those things. In Hebrews chapter 11, we find some examples of great Christians who endured the unthinkable for their faith. Women received back their dead by resurrection. And others were tortured, not accepting their release, so that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others experienced mockings and scourgings, and yes, also chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated. And one of my favorite phrases in the Bible, in parentheses, men of whom the world was not worthy. 
wandering in deserts and mountains, and caves and holes in the ground. And all these, having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised because God had provided something better for us so that apart from us, they would not be made perfect. Or what about 2 Timothy 3 and 12, which reads, Indeed, all who desire to live, a godly, uh, to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. To be a Christian in the first century wasn't about being a pretty good person. It wasn't about saying, yeah, I believe in Christ. Yeah, I don't go to church, but I love God. No. You wore the name Christian in the first century. You were probably going to be persecuted. More than likely going to be killed for what you believe. A far different cry from what we see today when someone wears that name Christian. If anyone wishes to come after me, Jesus said. If anyone wishes to be a disciple of mine, here is what's required of him. He must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow after me. For whoever wishes to, to, to uh, save his life will lose it, but whoever saves his life for my sake or loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. So commitment, according to Jesus, means giving everything you have. Enough is never just enough. It's giving your life. This is a master-slave relationship. This is a full-on commitment. This is about having the attitude that I am giving up everything I am to be a follower. Some people have the idea, well, I've given plenty in my, in my following. I've given a lot. You know, some people would say, you know, I, I'm at church every time the doors are open. I'm at Bible class. I volunteer for things. You know what? You're doing just what you should be doing. You don't get a gold star for that. You know, as a minister, I appreciate you being here. I appreciate you being involved in so many things. And Jake has lined out some goals that, that, that he has for, for members, you know, to be, at, to be at every service, to be a part of one ministry, those kind of things. I think that, that is great, fantastic. But all that is secondary to your commitment. Because if you're fully committed, you're going to be involved in other things. If you're fully committed, you're going to love the Lord and His church, and you're going to be here. You're going to participate. You're not going to be standing on the sideline. You're going to do something. Some people have this idea, well, I've given a lot, but have you given everything? That's really what this boils down to. Have you given everything? Have you fully committed? And that is a daily thing. God demands not a part of us, but the whole, every fiber of our being, every corpuscle of our being. He wants all of us. Enough is never enough. He wants everything. And Jesus said, you are to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That sounds like everything to me. Every part of you. The problem, of course, that we run into is that giving everything means giving up something. But I promise you this. Nothing that you ever give up will you regret. Never will you regret giving up anything in a commitment to follow Christ. If we trust in God and follow His way, we will never give up more than we get. In Numbers chapter 13, the Israelites are knocking on the door to the promised land. They're on the brink of Canaan. They're poised to enter. All of the mumbling and the grumbling and complaining led to this point. They're ready to go forward. But unfortunately, they would stay on the precipice. And the reason why is because they were stationary and not visionary. You see, as they get to the promised land, God sends 12 spies to go and spy out the land. They come back and they give a report. And because they discouraged the rest of the people with their support, they would never get to see the promised land. Unfortunately, instead of entering, they would spend 40 years wandering around aimlessly in the wilderness. Vision provides direction. And our vision must be God's vision. Psalm 119, beginning in verse 4, reads, How blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. How blessed are those who observe his testimonies, 
who seek him with all their heart. They also do, not, do no unrighteousness. They walk in his ways. You have ordained your precepts that we should keep them diligently. God gives us our direction. He provides our vision. And his vision gives us hope. It gives us purpose. It gives us direction. Our intention should be to align ourselves with his vision, not our own. To follow out of love and out of faithful obedience. The Israelites did not do this, and it proved to be costly. After 40 days, the spies returned, and they brought back some fruit of the land. We went into the land where you sent us, they said, and it certainly does flow with milk and honey, as if God would not tell them the truth. And this is its fruit. Then notice the word that follows. It's the word nevertheless. Anytime you see the word or hear the word nevertheless or, or however or but, understand that when you hear those words, it just means everything I just said, forget it. Now I'm going to tell you how I really feel. And that's what happens here. Nevertheless, the people who live in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified and very large. And moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. Amalek is living in the land of the Negev, and the Hittites, and the Jebusites, and the Amorites, all the ites, they're there. And you don't want to go there. You know, we see some qualities of stationary people. If we read through Numbers 13 and 14, that are very applicable to the church today. See if you can recognize these. Those who are stationary tend to be pessimistic, don't they? They tend to see the glass as half empty. They tend to see the thorns, but not the rose. They seem to always be criticizing and complaining. But you know what? Those who criticize and complain the most, nine times out of ten, are those who do the least. There's a correlation, a direct correlation, between those who want to play armchair quarterback and don't want to do anything. They're pessimistic. An optimist sees the donut. The pessimist sees the hole, right? And we see... That one who is stationary typically doesn't want to move. Why move? Why do anything? It's just fine where we're at. I enjoy the scenery at halfway. Why climb any higher? It's good here, right? But how could we ever know what we could be if we don't continue to climb? If we don't continue to tweak? If we don't continue to strive to realize our full potential? Oftentimes, those who are stationary are also phobic. They're afraid to do anything. They're afraid to step out. They're afraid. They're overly cautious. They continue to constantly, constantly calculate the cost. And even when every box is ticked, even when they know in their heart of hearts that this is something they need to do, they still come up with a reason not to. They refuse to go any further Ultimately, they're afraid, and that has hindered them. When everyone is not on the same page, problems arise. And that's another thing with stationary individuals is that they are problematic. They're pessimistic, they're phobic, but they're also problematic because they hold the group back. They keep everybody else from moving forward. If you're someone who is stationary and you're the squeaky wheel and we're ready to move forward, we've got to keep pulling you along. That holds us back as well. If we've got to constantly be catering to you or handling you with kid gloves, it keeps us from being what we should be and realizing our full potential. We don't want to leave you behind, but at the same time, you have a personal responsibility to get in the game and let's go. God does not call you to be a spectator. He calls us all to be participators. A participator doesn't just sit in the pew or sit on the sideline and observe the action and say, I wouldn't have done it that way. No, a person who is visionary, a person who is ready to move forward, constantly seeks a way to get involved because they're committed. They want to do more. They want to help the team or the church achieve their full potential. In Numbers chapter 14, as many problems began to erupt, we see these pessimistic, these these phobic, these problematic people. They had the problem of crying and complaining and confusion, all these things. It was one problem after another. And you'll remember what happens. They were set on getting a captain over them to lead them back to Egypt, back to slavery. They felt like that would be better. On the brink of the promised land, and they don't go forward. In fact, they move backward. But you'll always be moving backward when you're stationary. See, that's the, that's the rub. We look at stationary as, and we think of it as, as being settled and, and, and stopped in one place. 
But the truth of the matter is, when you're stationary, you're actually declining. You're actually moving backwards. You're certainly not moving forward, and you're really not standing still. You're dying. You're slowly but gradually moving backwards. You know, the people that we read about in Numbers felt powerless to go against the inhabitants of, of Canaan, and they were right to a degree. On their own, they were powerless, but they didn't factor in the power of God, that God was in control. God had promised them the land. That's why it was called the promised land. And yet, they didn't factor in his power. They didn't rely on him as being in control. They stood and they watched and looked at the scenery rather than moving forward. He had delivered them from oppression. He had protected them. He had sustained them. And yet, they still refused to look forward. They were so fearful and so intent on remaining stationary that the ten spies deliberately spread a bad report. They put the worst possible spin on the situation in order to discourage the rest of the group from going forward. The land through which we have gone, they said, is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great size. And somebody should have stood up at that point and said, yes, but... Here's the rest of the story. God is on our side. Not only are they big and strong, they may be giants, but we have a God that is bigger than everybody. And he has promised us victory. So what are you doing? Why are you trying to discourage people from moving forward? This is our land because God promised it to us. Likewise, why is the church sitting still after they've enjoyed great success? Why are they becoming complacent out of fear or pessimism when they know that God has brought them to that point? You know, for some people, it may make them feel a little uncomfortable. You know, it may make, it may make you feel a little uneasy when I say this, but I believe beyond the shadow of a doubt that God has brought us to this point. I believe that God has brought us to the point we're at today, and I fully believe that he will take us further if we follow his lead. Now, you can call me crazy. You can say, well, Chris, that's, that's, you know, that, that's getting a little out there. I hope you don't feel that way. I pray constantly for the welfare of this church, and I think God has answered our prayers. But I don't believe that God is going to be satisfied with us sitting still and saying, you know what? You've reached the... You've reached, reached the limit. You've reached the pinnacle. Congratulations. Now just sit and enjoy it. You know, Helen Keller was once asked, what could be worse than being blind? And her response was being able to see but having no vision. On August 28, 1963, on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C., Martin Luther King Jr. gave his famous I Have a Dream speech. Martin Luther King Jr. had a vision of a better tomorrow. Yes, there was civil unrest at the time, but he chose to look ahead. He understood that maybe not in his lifetime would it change, but he saw a brighter tomorrow, a greater future, where people would be considered equal and not be separated based on the color of their skin or their race. He had a dream, and I have a dream as well. I have a dream for Oldham Lane. And it's not necessarily being a church of a thousand people or being a church with, with an ornate building and all these other things. No, my dream is very simple. My vision for Oldham Lane is very simple. That we keep climbing. That each and every one of us individually make it a priority to be a true Christ follower, to be totally and completely committed, and to keep climbing. Let's pray. Most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, you have certainly blessed us individually. You have blessed us collectively as a church here at Oldham Lane. Dear God, we pray that, that not only you continually bless us, but we continually bless you in the way that we live our lives, as we seek to live out your truth, as we seek to proclaim the truth, as we seek to, to show others love and compassion, as we want them to be saved. God, help us 
to continual, to continually climb, grow and mature and make that a priority in our lives. Help us, Lord, to avoid the disease of complacency. And thank you so much for just the opportunity to be a child of God, to worship you in spirit and in truth at this place. And may we always seek your goodwill in everything that we do. It's in your son's precious name that I pray. Amen. You know, part of us all being on the same page as a congregation is for all of us to be right with God. And some of you sitting here this morning may need to make some changes in your life. Maybe you once proudly wore the name Christian, but you're not following faithfully. Maybe you've considered putting on Christ in baptism, you've just never done it. What's holding you back? What's keeping you from moving forward? May this be our mantra, and may we always seek to keep climbing. And if you need to make a change this morning, come now as we stand and as we sing.